Hey gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire, and today I'm going to be reviewing Stonewall Uprising. This is a deck building game that is also a fight for gate rights, designed by Taylor Schuss and published by Catastrophe Games. All right, so here is a setup of the solo mode of Stonewall Uprising. So there are a lot of things going on in this game, but at its heart, it is actually a very traditional deck builder, but it packs a major historical punch. So this can be played two player or solo. This is set up for solo, but in two player, you also have a whole market for the man. So one player plays pride in solo. You always play pride. And then the other player um, or the or the bot will play the man. Pride's goal is to open up the Overton window. And basically what that means is th that's a term for when society has decided that something is acceptable and that they're good with it. So basically pride is pushing to be socially accepted and considered just a normal part of society, um, which hopefully our Overton window is continuing to open. Meanwhile, the man's goal is to detain and demoralize enough people that the pride movement temporarily loses the game. Meanwhile, uh, in the 80s, you also have AIDS deaths. Um, and so there's a tracker up here that also gives the man a way to win, which is pretty brutal. But I would say that Taylor Shess, the designer, has a point putting it in there. So throughout the game, what's going to happen is um, you are deck building. So here's my starter deck. I grabbed a starter hand. And this hand has a lot of green circles in it, but it'll do. Basically, these top left things in the corners tell you the value of the card, which is used both on these little tracks and for purchasing power. Um, and they also tell you by shape and color which track they influence. So throughout the game, you're having a bit of a tug of war over three sectors of society. So you're trying to open up the Overton window up here. But in order to do that, uh, Pride has to beat the man on three different levels. One is systemic support. So every time the man manages to drag this cube into the end zone, they get to detain people. Meanwhile, Pride can undetain people by getting the cube into their end zone. Public support affects the Overton window, so if the man manages to drag the cube over here, it'll move the Overton window up. If Pride manages to drag it over this way, then you actually get some dice, and as you gain these dice, you roll your dice pool, and basically the idea is that whatever totals in your dice pool uh, contributes to your Overton window score, so you can get the cube to a certain point, and then roll your dice, and the total can help you win the game. And then we also have individual support, so that allows the man to demoralize people, but it also allows pride to move the Overton window down and therefore make pride more socially accepted in the United States. One thing that's very interesting about these tracks though, is that once you reach them, you don't stay in them. They actually reset to the middle. And then you use these tokens that are up here on the left to mark who has managed to get to the end zone. And whoever does that the most times each decade gets an event. So there are solo event cards for the man in case he manages it. And then there are also some 60s, 70s, and 80s cards for Pride that, you know, give you a, a different event each time if you manage to win it for Pride. The other thing you're going to be doing other than wrangling over these different trackers is, of course, buying cards to strengthen your deck. Um, and so the other thing that you're going to want to do is not play all of your cards because the totals in that top left corner impact what you're able to buy. So there are cost two, four, and six cards. And what's kind of fun about these stacks is that they contain a couple cards from the 60s, a couple from the 70s, and a couple from the 80s each. So as you progress through time, you're also going to see different cards. And all these cards are wonderful because they are based on real people, concepts, organizations, and events from the Pride movement. And Taylor Chess did a lot of research into the history of Pride to choose who to put in here. So if you want to learn about interesting activists from the past, uh, this is actually a very fun game to play because you're going to meet them in the course of play. And of course, they're going to have cool powers. So in addition to moving our little trackers back and forth, they're also going to do awesome things. And it can be really fun to play them. Meanwhile, in a two-player game, uh, I will say that the, the cards for the man are pretty brutal. So you get stuff like homosexuality is a mental illness, which is really tough to look at and then play as a card. Uh, government approval, already worried public. So, the, you know, this mentions kind of playing on Cold War fears in the 60s. Um, Ex-gay movement, lack of blood testing, police brutality. 
So if you're playing the man hate groups, you don't really have as nice and bright of a card set to play. Conservative radio with a yelly man is about right. Uh, and so that is by design. This game is designed to, to express Taylor's vision of what was happening and to celebrate the perseverance of pride through so many decades of people wanting to push the queer community down. The other thing that's very interesting about holding onto your cards is that it's not just as simple as playing out your deck and maybe saving some cards. The other thing that's important is whoever folds first um, does two things to the game. One is that unfortunately, if you fold first, you have to push one of these trackers in the direction of your opponent. You do get to pick which one. But you also make it so your opponent's cards values are doubled for the remainder of their turn. So if they keep playing cards, then they are going to be able to get extra spending after you have folded. So they have some time to really stick it to you. At the same time, every card that they play after you folded gives you an extra card play in the following turn. So there are advantages and disadvantages to being the one to fold first. And that kind of push and pull, I think, mirrors the push and pull aspects of the entire rest of the game. So that's basically how the game works. You also have uh, an Automa deck. So here what you have is just cards for the solo, and they all represent the man. They're just going to code different things that the solo bot's going to do. So you take a different action depending on what decade it is. The hands, once you reach four of them, that indicates that the bot is going to fold. And this is going to tell you uh, which tracker they're going to push in your direction if they fold. And so it's just a very simple, actually very nice and functional AI that really does the job. It's super simple. Pull a card, do the thing, keep going with your turn. So that's basically an overview of how this game works. Let's go ahead and have some final thoughts. All right, so now for some final thoughts. Overall, I want to say that I really enjoy Stonewall Uprising. I just think it's a really solid game. So if you already like to play deck builders, which I do, this one is pretty standard fare. You're building your deck, you're using the card values and cool events. Uh, in this case, you are pushing tracks back and forth, and that's what the cards are good for. But if not for the theme, this deck builder would feel pretty much like every other deck builder that you've ever played. But the thing is, that doesn't because of the theme. And so this is a... And so this is one of those times where I really think that the theme of this game elevates it. And Taylor Chess has done so in ways that I think personally are very profound, very thought provoking, and that you should engage with games like this in order to get somebody else's perspective on the world, to learn pieces of history that you did not know, and to learn about things like what is an Overton window, which I actually didn't know until I played Stonewall Uprising. But what Taylor has done is express the joy and excitement and just self-affirmation and freedom of pride. And he also makes some pretty brutal statements about those who have been opposed to pride over the decades. And his vision of the situation as a designer, as a gay man, really, really comes through in his game. So even visually, this is really, really clear. So I will say I don't find Stonewall Uprising to be aesthetically very pretty. There's, there's maybe too much color clash and design clash for me, but I like what it does in terms of what it's saying in the game. And in that sense, I would say that the graphic design is very successful. Because when you look over at the pride side of everything, everything is bright. Everything is joyful. Even when you know that the people on those cards are absolutely having a hard time in life, they look fresh and they look determined and they look beautiful. And that is an extreme contrast to the very bland very gray, very white male, very just unpleasant art and design for the man. And so on the one hand, you have people who are holding up rainbows and celebrating the streets. And then the other, you have a bunch of burning crosses and angry radio men. And I really like that even down to the art, this game really expresses how Taylor sees the world and how he wants the world to work out. You know, he very explicitly says that even if Pride loses this game, that the idea is that the victory is only delayed for a while. Taylor believes that the Overton window is going to accommodate the queer community. Taylor believes that Pride is eventually going to triumph in the end, or at least that's what his game believes. And I too want to believe that, and I hope that we're getting there. The one big complaint that I have about Solo is that because this game's strength is so thematic, um, when you are playing solo, you play as Pride, so you get all the enjoyment of Pride, like learning who the different figures are and feeling good about your cause. But the version of the man that you're playing against when you play against the Automa doesn't quite have the same punch as playing against another human. 
that's partially because of the human-human interaction aspect that is brutal in this game, but I'll get to that. The other reason is that the Otoma cards are just completely void of any theme. They're basically just symbols, um, and that works for an Otoma. Like, I completely get it. It's a very nice functional Otoma, but it doesn't feel quite the same as being beaten by somebody's card that says, you know, not enough blood testing in the 80s, and you've got your people getting AIDS, and they're deliberately playing stuff to make that worse. Or, you know, people who are playing something like, oh, moral majority, and, you know, you are feeling actually oppressed by cards with religious figures depicted on them. Um, there's a really different vibe to that. And actually, I think the solo mode is good, but I don't think that the solo mode is as emotionally affecting as the game played with two. And I actually think that that's a loss for this particular game because the real value, I think, of what Taylor's doing is giving a really strong view from his perspective of how he sees this history an offering of how we could see this history. Um, maybe a look in the mirror for people who've been on the other side of this history. And if you're not playing full two player, you can't feel that. And I also think that as, as so I'm not saying that I want to play the man against a pride bot because I really don't. And like, I completely understand why they did not offer that in this box. At the same time, I think that everybody who plays Stonewall Uprising should have to play the man at least once because it feels horrible. It feels horrible. And I think that that is on purpose um, and that it's part of the emotional experience of playing the game. You know, when you are the man, you have to play cards against your friend. Um, I'm assuming that the people you play with are your friends <laughs> that, you know, that say things like homosexuality is a mental illness and you have to look them in the eye and like, play that. And I find that very affecting um, in a way that I really didn't expect. So it feels very stressful to be the pride player going up against another human who is actually tr actively trying to demoralize you and plays cards and make it very clear about that with their art, with their theme. Uh, but I also think being the person who's doing the oppressing feels terrible. It's supposed to feel terrible. O oppression should feel terrible, both to experience and to perpetrate. And I think that Taylor Shuss does a really, really good job of putting that weight on the man, on that opposition player, uh, in a way that it's still like a fun deck builder and you still have, you know, kind of cool powers, I guess, <laughs> if oppressing people is cool. Um, and you know, there's a lot that you can do. You can absolutely win. There's like a satisfaction in making your deck work because that's just always true in a game, even when you're the bad guy. But oh man, does it wreck you a little bit inside. And to me, that's what makes this game so special. Um, you know, it's not super special in terms of its components. It's a Blue Panther on-demand printing. It's not necessarily very special mechanically. It's just, just another deck builder, I guess. Although it's a good deck builder. But what it does do is it evokes history uh, by putting real figures in the cards and real events and real organizations that I didn't know about from queer history. And it also evokes a feeling of just the grossness of oppression, the joy of trying to be your authentic self. And he does this in this very stark contrast on either side of the board. And I think that that is why this game is worth playing. So I think what makes Stonewall Uprising very special is that there are a lot of games that play well. There are a lot of games that play clean, but there are not as many games that unsettle me as much as this one does. And in that, Taylor Shess has not only delivered a very solid first game design, but an experience that I think that we should be open to as gamers who are trying to push beyond is it fun and into what does this designer have to say? Because Taylor Shess has a lot to say and he's very worth listening to. So that's how I feel about Stonewall Uprising. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Please like, subscribe, comment, support me on Patreon if you're feeling generous. And most of all, happy gaming.